As we launch into discussing your role as a facilitator in the design and implement stage, I just want to take a step back um, and um, remind all of us that the rationale for doing this work is to make is to make sure our patients are safe. Um, uh, all of this work we're doing because uh, we now know things about um, managing chronic pain um, and long-term opioid use that we didn't know 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it's about safety and it's also about quality of life. Um, so as you approach this work in terms of supporting the clinic teams, I think it's helpful to circle back to that concept um, as a, a coach or a facilitator or someone who's enabling the change. Um, none of us go into healthcare with the intention of harming <laughs> individuals. Um, so this is about preventing patient harm uh, because we know that long-term opioid therapy, oftentimes the potential for harm can be greater than the potential for benefit. Um, so that's what this is about. So we're gonna talk about your role as a practice facilitator, as a practice coach um, in supporting the process of change in the clinic, resources that are available to you, um, and to the clinic teams that you can bring to the table to help the clinic teams in this change process, activities that clinics commonly do in making changes in their clinic. And then we're gonna end with a discussion where we're gonna talk about, hmm, how do you engage clinicians and staff in doing this work? Because sometimes it is difficult there's a lot of competing demands in primary care. And there's a lot of areas of improvement that need to be tackled. So how do you engage clinicians and staff? Because this is not the easiest topic um, to challenge or the e easiest area of improvement uh, to, to tackle. Where are the touch points for you as a facilitator um, when you're supporting a clinic? Um, there are several of them that you should consider um, where you can have that, that touch point or, or interaction with supporting the people in the clinic who are actually doing the work of making the change. Obviously, there are opioid improvement team meetings um, where there's action plan going on. You can, you can perhaps attend those meetings um, as an external facilitator um, and support that clinic. They may come to you with specific requests um, because they've encountered a challenge um, and help for brainstorming through that challenge. For example, you know, we thought our, our electronic medical record is going to be able to do this for us, but we're running into problems. Are there alternative ways that we can do this since our EMR is not doing it for us? Um, we often find that just having a short phone call or Zoom monthly check-in with the QI lead in that clinic can be enormously meaningful to them. Even if it's just a monthly 15 to 30 minute check-in. How's it going? What can I do to help you? What are you doing next? Can I help you orient to what the next task is? What are the next steps? What resources do you need? Um, and then connected to that is finding resources. They request resources. Are there patient education materials that you're aware of? How do you risk stratify my, our patient population to determine visit frequency intervals? Should they be coming back monthly, every three months, every six months? Is there a way to do that? There are resources actually on the Six Building Blocks website that would you could bring to the table for them. Um, oftentimes you'll find that they want you to go to the website and find these resources and bring them to them. They don't wanna take the time to go to the website and search for them themselves. Um, the, the, the other thing you can do is actually host a, a shared learning call with these clinics. Um, we have found that when you get the, the, the opioid improvement team leaders in each clinic together on a short phone call um, to share what's going on in their clinic and what their experiences are, they can learn from each other. And you can be a host for that phone call. You can set up the time um, and the, the, the agenda. And there might be topics that people bring to the table and say, you know, in our next shared learning call, can we discuss 
um, difficult conversations with patients about tapering um, and how to support our clinicians and staff in doing that. Can that be the topic for the next shared learning call? How are other people doing that? So come up with a list of topics or agendas that you think clinics could, could discuss. So here are just a few of the resources that you'll find on the website as a facilitator or a, you know, a change agent. You're, you're the one who's helping them do the work. Um, you're at the elbow helping them do the work. Um, there's actually a workbook for this phase, just like the, the workbooks that have been discussed other, in other phases. Um, there's an action plan guide. There's a, a, a resource for how to do action planning that you can pull up and share with the team and help them um, with developing action plans. The shared learning call I just mentioned, there are some instructions and some a guide for how to, how to host the shared learning calls as a coach or a facilitator. Um, I wanna go back to the milestones again because every phase of work has milestones. Um, and there are tips for achieving the milestones with this phase of work um, on the website. If the clinic gets stuck or if you get stuck about what to help a clinic do, I would keep going back to the milestones for this phase. Go through the list again. What are, what are things that they should be achieving and how can you help them get there? Um, there's, a, there's also a tip sheet on common obstacles that we have um, seen clinics face and how they um, solve those, those challenges. Um, there's a, actually a, a resource that was developed um, not by us, but by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on practice facilitation um, about mapping and redesigning workflows in clinics that you as a facilitator can help clinics with. Use, use this, this module to help clinics redesign workflows. The, the module is intended for a facilitator to help you learn how to facilitate clinic in redesigning their workflow. Um, there's a resource on measure outcomes. We've touched on that already. And there's also a log for you to keep if you're supporting multiple clinic sites. So you've got five or 10 clinics that you're facilitating. There's a log that you can keep track of what each clinic is doing to help you remember where that clinic is and what you need to do next to help them. So it's kind of a log for you to track their work and to help you as the facilitator or a coach um, um, move them along. Um, and these are just tools that we found, found useful. Some may be more informational. Uh, some, but some of them may actually be uh, of practical use to you. I just want to touch on what is a facilitator? What is a coach? Um, you know, if you're a high school football team, um, the coach does not go out in the field and snap the ball to the quarterback in the middle of the game. The coach is on the sideline. So you're not doing the work for the clinic as a coach, as a facilitator. The idea is that you're enabling them to do the work. You're there as a guide. You're there as a, an encourager. You're there as a cheerleader. You're there as an accountability agent, right? They're, they may say, the clinic may say, oh my gosh, look at the schedule. Um, um, our coach is gonna meet with us next Wednesday and we haven't done the things that we need to do. Okay, let's make sure we get those done by next Wednesday so that we can report to our coach, that our facilitator, that we've, we've accomplished those tasks. So just checking in with them um, is, is serving as an accountability agent. Um, because there's always the tyr tyranny of the urgent and they sometimes don't get to everything. You're a knowledge broker. You bring ideas and resources to the table. You may say, oh, you know, I've seen that before. The, the clinic down in, in so-and-so town had this problem. Well, here's what they did to solve that problem. You want me to put you in touch with them? So you're, you're a boundary spanner and connecting people to help solve problems uh, between, between clinics as well. I think the order and timing of the work that the clinics do on the six building blocks um, varies based on where the, that clinic is on their journey to improving how they manage their patients on chronic pain who are on opioids. Um, and so the order and timing of things may vary by clinic. And that's another reason if you're assisting or facilitating many clinics to keep a log to help you keep track of where they are on their journey. 
But in general, we've seen most clinics and most clinical organizations start the process with saying, where are our policy on, on refills? Um, where are our policies on initiating opioids? Where are our policies on, on, on acute to chronic transitions? Where are our policies on, on what risk stratification looks like for our patient population? Um, and revising those and then revising the narcotic or the, the controlled substance agreement for the patient and making sure that you read both of them and say, are they in agreement? Do they say the same thing? Because sometimes you don't realize that what patient agreement says doesn't line up with what your policy is. Um, and, then, and then lastly, is there a consensus among the people who work in the clinic that, yeah, this is the way it ought to be. This is how we're gonna do this. Um, this is the way our organization manages these patients to make sure that we do not, that they do not suffer a harm, that they do not have an adverse uh, event uh, due to the medications that we're prescribing to them. Um, at the same time, many clinics, while they're working on, say, revising their policies and patient agreements, are at the same time working on their tracking and monitoring system, identifying patients, right? So using your electronic health record and doing that report where you're able to dig down and say, by provider, who are on opioids um, and looking at um, um, measures of prescribing uh, for that patient population and getting those reports put together. So, so you can you know, do this work in parallel because sometimes you're waiting on approval I'll have to say policy revising can take a long time because you have to sometimes go through that and go through multiple levels of getting it signed off on in your organization before it's official. And that can take weeks to months in some organizations. So sometimes while you're waiting on that process, you can go back and work on tracking and monitoring systems, reporting. You can work on, are there resources for complex patients? You can go back and work on what measures are we gonna to use to monitor success while you're waiting on approval of your policies. I would also say, or encourage you to think about um, including those who do the work and giving them responsibility and giving them authority to develop their own workflows. Um, one of the clinics we worked with, the providers were struggling with this and they finally said, you know, we're gonna leave the room. We're gonna let the MAs have an hour and talk about it and see if they can figure this out. And once the clinicians left the room, the MAs were really engaged in making the changes in the workflows. Um, and we're very successful in doing so. Um, and then think about how you can use your electronic health record to create solutions that support those workflows. Um, and encourage, I'd encourage you to include the person who, or the people in your organization who support your electronic health record um, in this process of implementing the building blocks. Um, and think about where are the low hanging fruit? Where are the measures that we think will be easiest to accomplish early on because early success empowers people. People can say, oh, look what we did. Okay, we can do this. And then you can tackle the next, um, the next uh, measure or the next improvement topic. Um, so suggest some simple, easy ways for them to do that. And to think of examples about, you know, as you're making changes, how are they gonna do patient outreach? Um, how are they going to communicate this to patients? Are there easy ways to communicate to these to patients that sort of diffuses the tension around patients uh, encountering the fact that you're making changes in their medication? Um, and as a, as a facilitator or a coach, you can think about how, 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 are they, how can they do this? How can they communicate with patients effectively? I think one of the problems with this is maintaining momentum because um, this work is not easy. Um, and also the process of building a consensus around, okay, this is how we're going to do it. So few ways that, that we've seen clinics do this. Um, they make an update on this work, a standing agenda item for their monthly provider staff meeting, and there's a report out. 
during the monthly staff meeting about where are we on this? What are, what are we doing this month? What's, what's happening? Um, we've also seen some organizations um, create a topic in their morning huddles. Some primary care clinics have huddles in the morning to go over their schedule. Sometimes they'll just give an update and say, oh, there's a new workflow. We've got the new workflow for this. Um, let's include that as a topic in our morning huddle. Um, I think as a, as a practice facilitator or a coach, it's also important for you to, to realize that you need to prepare them for the fact that they, they may not be 100% successful, and that's fine. That's normal. Um, they will probably need to modify and adapt. They may need to try something and it doesn't work. That's okay. Let's try something else. Um, let's tweak it. Let's, let's revise it, see if we can make it work better. And the last thing I'll say about, about clinic activities is sometimes clinics don't recognize their successes. And you as a facilitator or coach who comes in from the outside need to look for those small successes, successes and celebrate with them and say, look what you did. That's amazing. Way to go. That's awesome because I oftentimes don't recognize things that I've accomplished either. Um, it's just not in my DNA. So part of the role of a coach is to say, way to go, way to go team. Let's recognize that success.